I didn't initially want to do this, but I couldn't help myself. The Legend of Korra is one of those shows that just hits me in a special place, and not in a good way. As a longtime fan of the original Avatar The Last Airbender TV show, The Legend of Korra really excited me when it first came out. I watched through all the seasons, but I found that by the end of season two, it wasn't sitting well with me, and by the end of the series, I was overall unpleased with it. It wasn't the worst animated TV show I'd ever seen, but it certainly wasn't the best. In fact, I'd say that if it were a standalone show, it would be serviceable at least, but it's not standalone. It's a sequel to The Last Airbender, widely considered one of the best animated TV shows ever made. So already Korra has an uphill battle waiting for it. I must confess, I was not a fan of the show, but I wasn't alone. Several others like me found plenty of problems with the show, and I was going to let them handle the video reviews of it. But then I saw this video coming out in July of 2020. I hadn't seen it until just now. It's an hour and 50 minute long video defending The Legend of Korra. I'd never heard of this channel before watching this video, so I have no ill will or hateful intent to the creator of this video. I watched this video to see if his arguments... uh, had any weight to them and to see if perhaps there really was a misunderstanding between myself and the show. Was I judging too quickly? Well, let's find out. Just so you know, I'm not going to respond to this video all at once. As I said before, it's an hour and 50 minutes. I'm going to do this in parts and we're starting with, and we're going by his parts because he splits his video into parts. So I'm going to just do a video per part. He's broken his video into various parts. And so I'm going to dedicate each video to one. Ready? Let's go. Bro, I am going to get crucified for this video. As will I, my friend. As will I. So let's both agree to be civil about this, shall we? We're both bound for the cross. It kind of baffles me how Avatar The Last Airbender is widely considered by most, myself included, to be the best animated show of all time. Yet its sequel series is one of the most divisive shows among the cartoon community and is heralded by some as worthless garbage. I don't know how we got to this point as a society, but it seems to be the popular narrative at this point that The Legend of Korra is somehow a bad show, when in reality it's better than most animated shows out there, but whatever, we've gotten to the point where this video needed to be made. You know what? I'll grant you that one. Yeah, I do agree that Korra is better than a lot of animated cartoons out there today. In fact, I'd say it's far superior to some of the other crap I've seen on Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, and other channels. I do believe that Korra is worth some degree of respect for not being on that level of shows that believe childish humor and pitiful animation can be forgiven by quirky and dated memes and gags. So yeah, okay, props to Korra for that at least. The show tried to have more dignity than that, I grant you. I'm just gonna say it bluntly, there is no legitimate reason to hate this show as intently as some people do, since most arguments against it are either misinterpretations, straw man arguments, or are such minor issues that are blown completely out of proportion. Don't get me wrong, there are legitimate problems with this show. Not one person is denying that fact, but the issues that people present are often overblown to make it look way worse than it actually is. I've said it before on this channel and I'll say it again, but the people who don't like The Legend of Korra are the people who don't understand it, are so biased against it that they refuse to acknowledge anything that it does well, or are mad that it's not just a complete rehash of Avatar. Wow, um, that's a bold claim. Uh, I do not like The Legend of Korra, but it's definitely not because I don't understand it or because I wanted to be, wanted to see a redo of The Last Airbender. I do understand it for the most part. I'd be very careful with your wording here because you're already starting to alienate your audience. If your goal is to convince your audience, then don't outright make hyperbolic statements about them. It's going to turn off those who might fit into the category you're describing and might be willing to hear your points. There are some people out there who have an ignorant view of things, but if you want to help them understand where their ignorance comes from, insulting them is not a good way to help. You're completely free to dislike the show, but just because you dislike it doesn't make it an objectively bad garbage show. I like to keep Avatar Month as positive as I can because it's supposed to be a celebration of the series, but I think it's high time people started treating The Legend of Korra with that same respect. So today, I'm going full gamer rage mode, alright? Today, much like I did with Ash Ketchum, I am pulling no punches against this ignorance that plagues the community regarding The Legend of Korra. I'm your host, Matt CMG. Smash that motherfucking like button. Let's get weird. Let's get wild. Let's get right in to defending... The Legend of Korra. 
So the way we're going to do this is we're going to go point by point just like we did in Ash Ketchum Part 2. I'll be taking the most common and the dumbest criticisms of the series from various threads and videos from across the internet and debunking them to the highest possible degree using the rules of storytelling and character writing and my unhealthily immense knowledge of the Avatar universe. This is not going to be a direct response to anybody in particular. If you want something like that, then I recommend you go check out the Admiral's Analysis. He has a four-part series doing exactly that. But this video is going to be as general as I can make it for the sake of brevity. Again, this isn't to persuade you to like The Legend of Korra. If you dislike it, then you dislike it. That's, that's fine. It's going to be like that regardless. But what this video is setting out to do is to prove that most of the criticisms of the show are nitpicking non-issues and that this is objectively a great show and does not deserve to be called garbage, worthless, or anything like that. Let's get into it. So the goal of this video is not to persuade but to point out that all the criticism of the show is based on nitpicking and overgeneralizations. Fair enough. The standards and rules are now set. I'm ready to learn. We're kicking things off with Korra and her character development. I'm ready. You are the Avatar. I don't know what that is. So I kind of talked about this last year in my Korra is a good character video, but there's a lot of stuff in that video that I left out for the sake of brevity that I feel really needs to be said. For this section, I'm going to debunk every criticism relating to Korra as a character that I didn't already talk about in last year's Korra video. Some of these criticisms include that she's a Mary Sue, that she was made brown, bisexual, and female for the sake of diversity and nothing more, and that she's just some bratty kid and never changed or developed through the series. I already kind of touched on that last one in last year's video a little bit, but I'm going to go a little bit more in depth, and today we're going to focus on these particular three criticisms, and we're gonna start in backwards order because why not? This idea that Korra's entire character could be boiled down to being just some bratty, impatient kid is disingenuous at best, since anyone who has seen the show cannot reasonably think this. These people are technically right, but only for season one, which a ton of people seem to focus on when calling the show worthless trash, even though there's three other seasons, but whatever, we'll get to that eventually. Uh, ironically, I always thought that season one was the better of the four seasons. It was the only one I got through without cringing too much. So if I were to call Korra worthless trash, it would not be season one that I point fingers at. But the whole, uh, but leaving that aside, the whole bratty child thing. I don't mind Korra having a bratty personality starting out. It gives her character and makes her stand out and it opens the door for her to grow out of this phase and mature as she gets older and wiser. I mean, look at Aang. Aang didn't start out as a bratty child, but he start out, started out as naive, childish, a little bit of a show off. He, he was very much a little immature kid. He grows out of that. He becomes more mature. So character growth is necessary. And seeing a bratty, almost unlikable character grow into a more likable character is a good thing. She'll suffer some humiliations. She'll fight benders stronger than her. And she'll learn the meaning of maturity through trial and error. And her friends will help her along the way in that. that it's good character. Yeah. So is that what they did, though? That's the question. Any character writer will tell you that every character arc starts with the character having a faulty view of the world or of themselves, or in simpler terms, they believe a lie about either the world or themselves, and they learn the truth to that lie over the course of the story. Korra's lie that she believes, or at least one of them, is that as the Avatar, it is her duty to beat up bad guys and basically be our idea of a generic superhero, when that is not the case at all. The Avatar's job is to be a spiritual leader, to keep the world in balance, to serve as an arbiter of peace for all nations. She doesn't know any of this at first, and as a result, is not prepared for it, which is what starts her character arc. This is what changes her ideology and shifts her away from this lie that she originally believes. I'll agree that she's a tad unlikable in the first season, but what people don't realize is that she's supposed to be like that in the beginning so that you feel a sense of satisfaction when she finally does change her ways by the end of the season. Imagine if people said the same thing about Zuko, for instance, right? You could say, oh, he's just some angry brute who wants his honor back and treat him like that's all he is for the entire series. But to do so would be to disregard all the complexities to his character that develop or are revealed along the way and is completely missing the point of a positive change character arc. You can't praise Zuko for doing this while hating on Korra for doing the same exact thing. Obviously their arcs are different, but you get my you get my gist. They um they didn't do the exact same thing. You can't even begin to compare Korra and Zuko in terms of character development. Let's really analyze these two for a moment. Zuko is introduced as not just a brooding and angry teenager. In the first season, we learn his background. We see the scar on his face, and good dialogue reveals to us his motives for capturing the Avatar, revealing pieces and tidbits of past that really shapes him as a character. He's not just an angsty teenager. We see something behind it all. He has a solid goal, an obsession, and his obsession makes him a recurring 
antagonist. But his dark past and inability to know his place makes us sympathize with him. We feel for his situation even though we don't see him as a hero. Zuko is torn, be torn between reclaiming his honor and doing what he knows is right, often symbolized in choosing between his uncle or his father slash sister. As the series progresses, we see Zuko struggle, change, go through new alterations of situations and character. We watch him struggle, we watch him suffer, we watch him learn to love others and himself, and even when he chooses the Avatar's side, he still struggles to understand his place at his side and how to approach him. Zuko is a fascinating and amazingly well-written character. Korra is a girl who was born with natural talent, nothing like Zuko, who was shown to be nothing short of a disgrace. She had a mastery of three of the elements at a very early age and has a high sense of self-esteem. Again, not like Zuko. She wants to leave the Water Tribe and go to Republic City to begin her work as the Avatar. She does know the Avatar is more than just a superhero, but she doesn't understand how to be more than that. Unlike Aang, though, who worked hard to learn how, she just decides it's not worth the effort and when confronted by difficult training, difficult people, or opposition, tends to honestly throw a tantrum. By the end of her story, Korra does change, grant you, but into what? Zuko went from a character who we resented for his role in the story but sympathized with for his personal struggles and were so happy to see him finally come to his senses, whereas Korra was a girl who was full of herself because she was the Avatar and by the end was somewhat humbled. I mean, that's development, but nowhere near Zuko. Two totally different levels of development and intensity. You cannot boil a character down to just be what they are in the beginning and treat them like that's what they are for the whole series. Since if you were to do that, you are disregarding the entire point of the story. And the point of any story is to see our characters change and grow. So sure, Korra is an impatient, impulsive, bratty teenager in the first season, but as the series progresses, she changes drastically and is almost unrecognizable by the end, and many people don't bother to acknowledge this. In fact, just to prove that she's changed, let's compare Season 4 Korra to Season 1 Korra. Season 1 Korra would never have been able to do the things that she does later in the series because her mindset would not have been prepared to deal with any of it. When Korra defeats Kuvira and lets her live at the end of the series, she is showing great compassion and understanding of others that she learned along the way. If Season 1 Korra were in this situation, she would have beat the fucking shit out of her. If Korra didn't change it all throughout the series, then why did the former happen, but the latter didn't? It's because she grew as a character, and that's kind of the fucking point. Fighting is something the old me would do, but that always made things worse. Let me talk with Kovira. Hell, in season one alone, she changes a fuck ton. She starts off in episode one being impatient, jumping into fights and having no spiritual connection at all, to being a patient person, learning when not to fight, and was able to connect to her past lives long before Aang restored her bending. The character growth is there, anyone who says it isn't is literally wrong. I don't know many people who say she had no character growth. You might be referencing people I don't know about or posts I don't know about, but I haven't really seen anyone argue that Korra's problem is her lack of growth. I do think Korra had development, but I don't think that's what people hold against her. For the second point, I'm gonna try to stay apolitical here, but I have seen, albeit rarely, it's still enough for me to address it, people who claim that Korra only exists to further some sort of diversity agenda for the leftist SJWs and all that kind of headassery. This is in regards to her being a girl, to her being a person of color, and to her being bisexual. Starting to sound like every Lily Singh joke out here, am I, am I, am I right? Haha, <laughs> fuck you. Starting off with her being a girl, this one is pretty easily debunked. You realize there could be female avatars too, right? Do the, do the words Avatar Kiyoshi ring a bell? Uh, Avatar Yang Chen, perhaps. Even so, Mike and Brian have discussed Korra's creation in interviews a lot, and every single time, they tell the same story where one of them said, hey, what if we made this character a girl? And the other one said, Okay, it's not that complicated. There's no agenda pushing to be found here. If you have a problem with a female protagonist, chances are you've you got, you got other problems to deal with, buddy. I have never heard anyone argue that Korra was a political agenda driver because she was female. But I have heard people use that as a straw man. This is a conversation I've heard where someone says, I don't really like the legend of Korra. And then the response is, why? Because she's a girl? You don't like girl lead characters? Besides, I have no issue with a female avatar. Never have, never have, and I never will. I don't think anyone had an issue with it. In fact, I thought it was kind of interesting. It'd be an interesting way of looking at her character. It's how she was written that most people take issue with. As for her having a darker skin tone, this is not only very easily explained with in-universe reasons, but it's not even something that's central to her character and is never even brought up in the show. We know how the Avatar cycle works. We know that after Aang, we needed a Water Tribe Avatar, so this character had to be brown anyways. Look at almost any Water Tribe character in the original series, and you'll find that all, if not most of them, are clearly of a darker skin color. Again, I haven't seen anyone pushing this argument. In fact, 
No one pushed this ever. It's not like they made her suddenly black and everyone had an issue with it. She was meant to look like a water tribe native, and she does. You know, she she has a very similar skin tone to Sokka, Katara, Grand Grand. I don't see where the problem is. I have never heard anyone argue this. As for Korra being bisexual, I did a whole video on that years ago, but to summarize, she was shown being bisexual for a total of like one minute at the very end of the series, nor was her sexuality even remotely related to her arc in any capacity. So this is really a non-issue, just like the rest of these. Really think about what you just said. Her bisexuality was only shown for a minute and was not a fundamental part of her character. So if it wasn't, why emphasize it at the end? Why bring it up at all? What was the purpose when they could have easily ended with Korra surrounded by her friends or Korra standing triumphant over Republic City? Why emphasize a bisexual relationship at the end if, as you say, it had no real founding or purpose in the character? Maybe, just maybe, to drop in a small piece of sociopolitical pandering that the creators knew would get the media attention. If not that, then for what reason? Why just suddenly drop it in there? You said yourself, it wasn't a big part of her character, it was never really referenced, and it was only shown for about a minute. Then why drop it in there? In my opinion, making Korra have a relationship with Asami at the ending of the show, with them disappearing into the spirit world, was actually a large insult to her character and the others. In the finale of The Last Airbender, yeah, Aang and Katara kiss. But they also show all the characters gathered together in happiness, revealing that their relationship is what held the show together. Their dynamic, their arcs, had they had all reached a conclusion, and their fellowship was the most relevant aspect of their story. Korra? All her friends tell her how awesome she is and go their separate ways to follow their own jobs, destinies, and relationships, while Korra sneaks off with Asami to the spirit world. Mako and Bolin are almost sidelined, Tenzin is relegated to old man in the corner, it's not, it doesn't feel like Team Avatar. See, that's the thing. That's what I think come, it all comes down to. I never, at the end of the show, I wanted to feel like this was a team effort with all the struggles and difficulties Korra had to go through. You'd think, okay, well, now we're going to show her with her friends and they're all going to be happy and they're going to be, you know, hugging, sharing moments with each other, bonding. It's, or maybe, maybe it shows that she grew, you know, she went from this show-offy girl into a girl who is humble and wise to become Avatar, doesn't end with that either. It just, it, by your, it just ends with her going off with Asami into the spirit world, like this was what we were building up to the whole time, this is our character's closure, this is the final note that we want to give the show. By your own admission, it had no part in her character arc, so it's literally shoehorned in there just to say, look everyone, Korra is progressive. It turned a character that could have been defined by her friends and relationships into a trophy. And I may be wrong. Maybe they were planning this all along. But by what you just said, what you just said it, it was only a minute long and it had no relevant standing on her character. If that's the case, why add it? The Katara and Aang relationship had clear moments where the two had chemistry, clear moments of relationship, clear moments of, rom of romantic tension. Clearly, they were building up to this, so when they kiss in the end, it feels justified. Here, we don't see enough of a hint, and I people say, oh, they dropped hints. Not really enough of them. We never see much. The most we see is a friendship build between them, but Heck, Aang had a friendship with Sokka. Were they supposed to get together? See, that's the thing. We never see anything build up to it. The only real thing we get is the end. And you want to know how I know this? People were asking if that's the case. Were they really getting together in the end? Because we weren't entirely sure. Mike and Brian had to come out and say it in a post. So, yeah, that's my stance on that. Sorry, I'll get off my soapbox. Again, I only see these things posted rarely, but if you do happen to be one of these people who thinks this unironically, then do us all a favor and fuck off. We don't want bigots in, this, in the Avatar community, and we especially don't want any fucking halfwits. And speaking of halfwits, let's talk about arguably the biggest buzzword in entertainment discourse today, the Mary Sue. This is a term that so many people use incorrectly because it's thrown around so liberally without any regard for what it actually means. A Mary Sue is defined as, quote, a type of female character who is depicted as unrealistically lacking in flaws or weaknesses. And the fact that some people can see this definition, watch the show, and apply it to Korra is baffling, to say the least. I, I genuinely can't even fathom the mental gymnastics necessary to see a character who does nothing but struggle and earn her victories and say, yeah, 
that's a Mary Sue. In case you are one of these Nimrods, however, allow me to explain. Let's take a look through the series and compare the things Korra does to this definition of Mary Sue. Let's start from episode 1, which I think a lot of people have the most problems with in regards to this. Korra is shown to be able to bend three of the four elements at a very young age and over the course of about 13 years is trained in each bending style, making her a bending prodigy. While improbable, this is something that is central to Korra's character growth as the season progresses. It establishes that she is good at bending and values it greatly, and considering this is the introduction to the premise of her arc for the season, you need to suspend any disbelief. The same way you have to suspend your disbelief that Aang was frozen for a hundred years and came out unharmed, and was the youngest airbending master in history at age 12. It's called establishing a character and the premise. We talked about this in last year's Korra is a good character video, but I'll talk about this more in depth a bit later in the video. And stop. J just stop. Several problems with your first example. You admit that her being a prodigy at age four and already a master of three elements by her teens is improbable, but then dismiss it as being part of her character, and then tell us to use our suspension of disbelief, just like with Aang living through the iceberg situation. Here's the problem with that. First, you're not explaining why it's not a Mary Sue trait that she's a bending prodigy who is able to learn and understand the basics of bending from the age of four, even though Avatar Roku said himself, mastering the elements takes years of discipline and practice. Mastering the elements takes years of discipline and practice. But you're actually making an excuse for it. You're saying that because it's a fu you're saying that because it's fundamental to what her character arc is going to be, we just need to accept it so the story can please work. Thank you. That's not how this works. Mary Sue's often have these unrealistic traits and powers specifically so the story can work for her. I also would like to point out that Cora did not earn her bending skills. She was shown to have them naturally as a toddler. How is that earning it? We don't see her training or growing in it. She's already bending elements she barely understands the nature of. In The Last Airbender, Aang has to understand the nature of each element, the physical, mental, and spiritual properties that are required to bend the elements. Korra hasn't had to learn any of them, and she can already bend three of them with almost masterful proficiency as a teenager. Maybe she could master one element by that time, but three? Three? And as for the Aang and the Iceberg scene, yeah, the difference there is that we see Aang didn't achieve that fear through his own skill training or prodigy status. The Avatar state, which Roku revealed was a self-defense mechanism to protect him in times of danger or stress, kicked in and saved his life. The Avatar state is a defense mechanism designed to empower you with the skills and knowledge of all the past Avatars. The glow is the combination of all your past lives, focusing their energy through your body. In the Avatar state, you are at your most powerful. The manner in which she did it was miraculous, but her but it was still logically sound based on the rules and, that Avatar had the sh and the show had provided. Korra's prodigy level can't even be explained by her own reasoning of "I'm the Avatar, you got to deal with it." Even as an Avatar, Aang was not a prodigy in everything he tried. Even as the Avatar, Aang was only a prodigy of airbending. The two things are not good comparisons. Plus, let's really look at another thing. You say that Aang was given his prodigy status as an airbender. We don't see him as a toddler bending air. We see him able to do cool moves, and we see him already mastering the fundamentals of air bending at a young age. But we know that he can't do everything, and we also see him struggling to learn earth bending. We see him have some proficiency with water, but not masterful level. And we see him have a bit of an odd relationship with fire bending. Whereas Korra, at four years old, can already bend not only water, but earth and fire the element that's supposedly supposed to be her opposite if she was going to have trouble with an element why wasn't it fire which is supposed to be your elemental opposite see that's the thing she's already kind of bending rules now does that mean that there's some unspoken rule in avatar that the avatar has to struggle with their opposite element no but there is a rule in avatar where roku said mastering the elements takes years of practice Aang did not have a mastery of the elements when he fought the when he fought Fire Lord Ozai. He had enough mastery to be able to hold his own briefly until he got beaten and had to access the Avatar state again. Whereas she has a masterful proficiency as a teen in three of the elements. I'll get into more of that later.
Moving on, we later see Korra subdue a group of triple threat triads of being arrested and reprimanded for it, showing us that her actions were not the best decision, and showing that she has flaws in her judgment. Mary Sue's are known for always being right and never making mistakes, yet right from the get-go, we see Korra make a mistake. We also see her make mistakes when going up against Tarlac's task force, putting Mako in danger with Amon, and just to name a few, and those are just in the first season. Her making mistakes is kind of the point, since she learns from them by the end of the season. You know, she deals with the consequences of her actions. Okay, this is not entirely entirely true. Mary Sue's can make mistakes and can be incorrect, but what matters is not their mistakes, it's if they suffer for them. Your definition of Mary Sue is a sound one, but it leaves out a key part of the Mary Sue character that needs to be addressed. When I look for a Mary Sue, I don't look for a perfect character. I instead search for the character for whom the plot always benefits. Mary Sue's possess the power to bend the plot and world to their needs. For example, yeah, Cora beat up some thugs and got into trouble with the law, but was she morally wrong? Were, the, were we, the audience, supposed to see her actions as wrong? Were we meant to recognize this was a weakness for her? In fact, Lynn's attitude towards Cora makes Lynn out to be unlikable, a stick-up-her-ass-by-the-book cop who just can't understand that Cora was doing the right thing. Besides, ask yourself, does Cora ever permanently suffer from her mistakes or errors? You say she has to suffer with the consequences of her actions at the end of the season. What consequences? What does she suffer from in a lasting sense? Does she lose her bending permanently? No. Does she lose a love interest in Mako? No. Does she lose a family member or friend? No. No mistake that she makes in this season has a consequence that she must deal with long term. Sure, later seasons have a few long lasting consequences she has to deal with, but it's debatable whether or not they are her mistakes or simply unfortunate happenstance. But you said season one, so I'm basing this on season one. Another common trait of Mary Sue's that people apply to Korra is that everyone else immediately likes her for no discernible reason, yet this is wrong because Korra has plenty of enemies that aren't the main villain. These are people who don't actively try to kill her or anything like that, they just don't like her. And we can see this with characters like Lin, the Equalist protesters, not to be confused with the Chi Blockers, the Southern Water Tribe citizens don't like her for not taking sides, President Raiko almost always opposes Korra, the Earth Queen straight up doesn't respect her, and even the spirits aren't too fond of her. Point is, she's far from being a person everyone likes for no reason. Okay, and how are we the audience supposed to feel about these characters that don't like her? When she's in conflict with Lin, the Earth Queen, or the President, do we side with Korra or with these other characters? More often than not, we sympathize with Korra, right? That's the point. It's not too much about whether or not every character likes her, it's more about whether or not her flaws lead people to dislike her. Lin dislikes her because she sees Korra as a troublemaker, but we know she's a good-hearted person. Also, Lin comes to like her by the end. The Earth Queen is a bitch that we all were supposed to dislike. The President is just power-hungry and full of himself. I mean, even if they aren't villains, they're not, they're not meant to be liked by us for standing against her. We're supposed to hope Korra can work around them or overcome them. If, for a good example, think about Luke Skywalker and Han Solo. When Luke first met Han, Han wasn't too fond of him. He often insulted him, told him to take a back seat or get out of his way. He saw Luke as annoying. Were we supposed to dislike Han for that? No, we were supposed to see Han as the more experienced smuggler who was aloof and didn't really care about other people as much as he did his own personal interests. Didn't mean we didn't like him, it meant that there was a clear character difference. That's what we're looking for here. Are we seeing that in Lin? No, we look at Lin's attitude towards Korra and go, come on, Lin, why couldn't you see that Korra was doing the right thing? So, obviously, we're meant to pick a side in that situation. She also doesn't always win like many Mary Sues do. In fact, we see many times throughout Season 1 and the series as a whole moments where Korra is vulnerable, in despair, in distress, needing to be saved, and straight up defeated. All things that Mary Sues do not do. We've seen her weak after escaping Tarlac's prison, hopeless that she had split from Rava, needing to be saved after fighting Zaheer, and the first fucking half of Season 4 was Korra being straight up depressed and suffering from PTSD. Yet people call her an infallible character. Actually fucking unbelievable. If you somehow think Korra is a Mary Sue, you're straight up wrong. Now settle down, my friend. Let's talk about those losses. I do agree with you that she loses quite a bit. In fact, I'd argue it's hilarious how often she loses or gets the crap beaten out of her. In fact, how many times has she won a battle in the Avatar state? You know, that state that Aang used to beat the shit out of juiced up Fire Lords? How come she gets beaten any time she's in that form? In my opinion, the developers were trying to make Korra eat humble pie and make her look somewhat vulnerable so he'd sympathize with, her, sympathize with her, much like how Zuko often lost his fights so he sympathized with him. Except instead, it made her look undeserving. I don't feel proud of her or like I wanted to cheer for her. 
I kind of want to ask if she wants to sit out the rest of the show and let other characters do the work for her. Now, that's just my opinion, though, and you are right that she is quite a loser in most cases, so yeah, I'll, I will concede that point. She does lose a lot, and that is rare for a Mary Sue. I, I grant you that one. If you thought I was done, you're also dead wrong. Because the absolute worst criticism labeling Korra as a Mary Sue is when people say that she was handed everything on a silver platter when it's literally factually incorrect on most occasions. The only time I can maybe understand this is the end of season one where she gets her bending given back to her. But even then, there was a character growth related reason for it and it was relevant in the next season. Th there you go again. I'm dismissing the obvious Mary Sue moment by saying it's for the sake of character development. You can't do that. It's like if Goku in Dragon Ball Z was approached by Vegeta as he got dynamic and he just said, Kakarot, here, I'm going to give you this magical necklace that will let you turn Super Saiyan. Super Saiyan was an important moment of character growth for Goku, so it doesn't matter if he actually worked for it or earned it or not as long as he gets it somehow. That's not good writing. That's the definition of a deus ex machina. And on that note, let's also talk about that scene. What else happened in that scene besides Aang restoring her bending? Well, she activated the Avatar state. How? Did she work for it? Train for it? Learn from a guru? Enter a difficult or life-threatening state? Because after all, Roku explained to Aang very clearly that the Avatar state was a defense mechanism that activated, allowing the Avatar to access his, their previous lives. So, did any of that happen? No. It was given to her. And you can't argue that it was just her natural avatar power finally manifesting. Because if that's the case, why didn't she enter it when Amon tried to take her bending away? In my opinion, that was the perfect moment for her to enter the avatar state. As soon as Amon is about to take her bending. Because that's the moment of peak fear, of peak danger. Her avatar state should have kicked in like wildfire. And of course the argument's going to be, because she wasn't spiritually gifted yet. She didn't have spiritual training. Really? Aang wasn't either when he did it to freeze the water around him, and you also said earlier that she was already showing spiritual maturity before Aang restored her bending. And was able to connect to her past lives long before Aang restored her bending. The character growth is there. Anyone who says it isn't is literally wrong. Quite literally, she was given not only her bending back, but also the Avatar state. And we see her able to call it on command in the next season. If you look at all of Korra's quote-unquote power-ups, it's fairly obvious that she earned almost all of them. I explained her airbending in last year's video, but the short of it is that her struggle throughout the season to learn airbending was caused by fear, and she was able to airbend when she overcame that fear. That is 100% false. Korra struggled to airbend in episode 2. What was her fear at that point? When she hadn't even met Amon or knew of her powers to take away bending. It, and Korra was struggling to airbend from the moment she got with Tenzin, even before she knew what Amon was capable of. Also, what fear did she overcome? She was afraid of losing her bending, and then she lost it. She literally activates it when there is no more fear to overcome at all. She has nothing to fear anymore. Amon took her bending, so her great fear was realized. Not only this, but her sudden call upon airbending has no basis in the lore of the show. Think about this. Note. Her first airbending technique, what was it? She punches at the air and creates an air pressure an air pressure blast. Punches. In the second episode, Korra suddenly figures out the movements of Bagua without trying. It just came naturally when in a pro bending tournament, even though she struggled in conventional learning. How did she figure it out so seamlessly? And then, even if she did figure it out, she must know that punches are rarely used in airbending because she never throws a punch while doing these techniques. Please, count the number of punches Aang used in his fights using airbending. If he used them, it was incredibly rarely. Why? Because the art of airbending is not about physical force, but circular, circular movement and flowing evasion. Her spirit kaiju in season 2 was dumb, but it was an ability she already had in energy bending with a power boost from the spiritual energy of the Tree of Time. And this was done without the help of Rava. This was her own spirit. And how did she earn that? You just said that all these power-ups were things that she earned or worked hard to get. How did she earn this? From spirit bending training? Who trained her? Tenzin? How did he know it? What did she do to earn or achieve this power through hard work? Are you saying that because it's her own spirit, it's therefore her power and her hard work? That's like saying Naruto earned the nine-tailed fox. 
Regaining her connection to Rava was a result of accepting what Zaheer did to her after struggling for half a season to use the Avatar State. None of these things were easy to do, many of them taking parts of a season or an entire season to achieve. Meanwhile, Aang over here went on a full spiritual journey to access the Avatar State in a day or two, not to mention that he was straight up given energy bending and used it with no prior training. Compare that to Korra, who took years to achieve that same thing, and you've got a character who is way more realistic. That's not to say Aang is a bad character, he certainly isn't, but you can't claim that Korra was handed things when not only is that not true, but Aang was handed way more than Korra ever was, i.e. the Lion Turtle. If you're gonna fault Korra for that, then you have to fault Aang for doing the same thing. But people won't do that, which shows the clear double standard people have for these two shows, but I will get to that later. Okay, sure, Aang was taught spirit bending by the Lion Turtle, but it's never established how long he was with that turtle and what all the turtle taught him. Perhaps it took longer than a touch and he was schooling Aang in its use somehow. I don't know. But let's give you that and say Aang was handed that power. Let's give you that and say Aang was handed that power. Fair enough. Korra was handed a prodigy level skill in three elements, though it goes against what Roku said about the Avatar learning the elements. Handed airbending, handed the restoration of her bending, handed the Avatar stat, and handed a giant kaiju power up. And as for the spirit bending thing, so a giant lion turtle taught Aang, but who taught Korra? Who taught her that? Did she earn it or was it handed to her? She certainly was proficient enough in it to restore everyone's lost bending, so even if she wasn't a master of it yet, she sure had some degree of skill in it. See, that's the thing. You keep pointing at Aang saying, Aang did it too, it's okay because Aang did it too. If you insult Korra, you have to insult Aang too. Yeah, but another facet to this is... What did Aang do to get it? Yes, the Lion Turtle touched him, but we also hear other quotes from the Lion Turtle. Like, for example, when he's battling the Fire Lord's spirit, we hear the Lion Turtle's voice, implying that Aang had a longer conversation with the Lion Turtle, perhaps through training. To bend another's energy, your own spirit must be unbendable, or you will be corrupted and destroyed. Whereas with Aang, he touches her, suddenly she has the power. I, I don't understand that. I guess the only explanation you could make is that because Aang could um, spirit bend and the Avatar state allows her to call upon the powers of her past lives, then that means that she was using Aang's power to do it. And if that's the case, it was still handed to her. She didn't earn it. It's just a part of the Avatar state, which again, was given. Korra is not a Mary Sue, plain and fucking simple, because she does not fit the definition at any point. Actually, at several points. Look, here's my stance on Korra. I want to like her. Korra herself isn't a bad idea for a character. I thought she'd be a unique and refreshing take on the Avatar from a teenage perspective. I didn't even mind her having a few brushes with romance, fear, anxiety, and her own ego. It made her an interesting character to me. But what hurt her was the fact that she didn't really earn anything. Her very first line in the show is, I'm the Avatar, you gotta deal with it. She doesn't earn the mantle of Avatar, it's given to her. She doesn't train for years upon years to understand and master the elements. She has the basics of three down by age four and masters them in over a decade. Look, as a martial artist myself, imagine mastering karate, capoeira, and krav maga in just a decade and being able to beat other masters with little effort. Again, it's not impossible, but very convenient. She was given airbending. We only see her training in airbending for one episode and then only see occasional glimpses of it in other episodes. So we don't see what all she's doing to obtain the skill. But she suddenly pulls it out of her ass when she needs it the most. She doesn't gain the avatar state from emotional fear or pain, but rather because Aang gave it to her. She doesn't have to train to master it. By season two, she can call upon it when needed. And as a warrior, she's lesser than Aang. Despite training longer in the arts of bending and being a prodigy in three of them, Aang has a higher win record than she does, making her look almost pathetic by comparison. I guess, it was, I guess this was done to make us realize she needs her friends more than ever, but by the end of the series, they're all kind of detached from her. Only Asami remains because, mm, guess that fan service. Here's the thing. <clears throat> You keep dismissing a lot of the problems that people point out by saying, look, it's a part of her character development. It's important to her character arc. It, it, it's it's valuable to that. So just suspend, extend your suspense of disbelief. Throw out, give us your suspension of disbelief. You just have to just accept this, okay? See, that's that's the problem. We can't. 
Rules were established in the original show for a reason. If Cora starts bending or breaking these rules for the sake of her character, what does that say about her character? It means her character needs to cheat to convince us it's good. It means that the writers could not have come up with a more creative story. Cora being a prodigy at the beginning of the show, okay, I'll I'll forgive that one. But why was airbending the big difficult one? Oh, because it's spiritually because it's a spiritual one. Really? Because Aang wasn't that spiritually gifted either starting out. Just look at his experience with Haybot. And then the whole calling upon airbending at any point. How does that make sense? We don't see enough of her training in it to understand the fundamentals of it. And then the whole Avatar Aang returning her abilities. You admitted that this was one of the closest moments to him handing it to her, but then dismiss it as part of her character arc. I'm sorry, but that's a deus ex machina. It came out of left field. It's never been established before. No one's explained how this was possible. Very few people have explained how this was possible. I'm sorry. I just, I don't buy that. There has to be an explanation for it. You know what would have been really interesting? What if they spent a season with her only being able to airbend? Wouldn't that have been more interesting? Maybe we could have had a whole season where she's mastering airbending, getting the hang of it, learning how she can still be the avatar while still being limited in her bending ability, and then maybe later, through a visit to the spirit world or something, she regains it. Maybe that would have made a more, more interesting story, but no, just Aang pops up, here's your powers back, good job, and then he's gone. See, that... That's bad to me. That's bad writing. That's They wrote themselves into a corner and quickly had to figure out a way to give her back her powers. Bad writing to me. Very bad writing. I'll end the video here and check back in later to see his points in part two. I don't want to hate on this guy, so don't y'all hate on him either. I'm just here to understand his arguments and see if I have more to learn because I'm always happy to learn. See you in part two and see you in my next video. Take care.